Hello. Oh, hello. How's it going? Mm. Hmm. I think you need to, I think the easiest thing is, uh, <clears throat> as I said in the issue, just go ahead and squash your commits down and sign that last one. Yeah, but there's stuff like, uh, yeah, I did, a, I did a rebase in the middle of that. And that was, I did the rebase on that wrong commit. So I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure how I'm going to go and resolve that now. Well, one option, it's not pretty, is to kill the PR and create a new one. Yeah. Or, I mean, if you want, I, I could take a stab at it if you want. Just save your work first. And I, if you want, I can go in there because I think as an admin, I can do some funky stuff. I can try to squash it and rebase for you or whatever. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you could try that because I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what to do with that one. Okay, I'll take a look at it. I didn't, I didn't actually look at it yet. I just, I just saw your comment, but yeah, I, I could take a stab at it. Just, but like I said, save your stuff off to the side just in case I completely screw up and delete all your commits. I mean, I, I, I can, I can literally go. I can abandon. I can take the text. I can abandon the, 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 uh, the PR, and then put that text in, and basically just kill the history, and then, and then pretend it's a new file. That's, that's probably the cleanest way to do this. So, so I, that, that I can do. Well, it's up to you. Do you want me to take a try at it first or or just go for it? It's up to you. If you if you if you need to spend more than 10 minutes on it, I would say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tell you what, I suspect this call is definitely not going to take the full two hours and it may even take less than the one hour. So okay. I'll take a stab at it first and I'll ping you afterwards. All right. Okay. All right. Uh Tommy, yo. Uh, yo. Yo, Lucas. Hello. Hello, and Simon. Hello, Doug. Hello. Oops. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Doug. And. Chris Hansen, are you there? I am. Hey, I can't remember. Is this Morning. your first time here or not? Yeah, I'm subbing in for a, uh, one of my colleagues, Christian. Ah, Christian. Okay. Cool. Well, welcome. Um, how are or how are you there? Yep. Hello. Thanks. Hello. And Klaus. Yes. Hello. Hello. And Remy. Hi. Hello. Uh, David. Oh, no mic yet. Doo -doo. Oh, Ginger then. Hey, Doug. Hello. Good morning, Doug. David. Hey, hey, David. And Mr. Mitchell. Good morning. Hello. Uh, da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -dun. How's everybody doing? Awesome. <laughs> it's great. Fantastic. That's just good, but awesome and fantastic. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> what day is it? What day is it? <laughs> they all have to kind of blur, don't they? Mm. So wait a minute, I'm confused. Chris, did I mishear you? Didn't you say you're subbing for Christoph? Or was it Christian? Uh, Christian. Christian, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Too many C's in there, okay. Yeah, well, I'm here too. And uh, my Colleagues are here. Uh, we'll also join in a minute. Okay, cool. Da -da -da -da. Good morning, Doug. Hey, Vlad. How's it going? Mm. Meh. Meh. Me, uh, yeah, I can use a count on you for something so excited and happy. Huh? That's, that's not like you. The pandemic is getting to me. Uh, okay, I understand that. All right. Hey, Daniel. Yeah, hello. Hey, Jim, you made it. I did. Excellent. Sorry, Sorry about that. That's okay. All right, another couple minutes, then we'll get started. Hey, Lance. Hello. Eric, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Good. Good. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Okay. Well, I mean, well. Hey, someone just joined the name S A N A N D. If you want, we, we typically track people uh, for attendance and yes. they can get voting rights by attending stuff. If you want to put your name and company into the chat, I can I could replace it with your real name or your full name, I should say. That's my colleague. Um, he's uh, with Commerce Tools. Ah, got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can spell this right. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right, and someone else went flying by. Who was it? Lou, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hey, oh, good morning. How are good morning. you? Good. How about you? I'm pretty good. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So I think we, we're three after the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. 22. Okay. Cool. I saw, I did remove one AI. I can't remember which one it was. It was Slinky with versus SQL PR because you already did that one. But there are other AIs out there for folks if you're so, remind, if you're so inclined to remember that. Uh, community time. Anything from the community people want to bring up? All right. Uh, SDK calls this week. Um, just to quickly double check. I doubt we have anything on the agenda. I didn't notice. Let me see. Yeah. So we have until the end of this call to add something. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We have something. If you want to add something, go ahead and add it before the end of this call. Otherwise, we may not have a call. Um, moving forward. Uh, discovery interop. I don't think we really talked about anything last week. Just a reminder, we are planning on doing the interop starting at the end of March. So that's about what, two, three weeks away or something like that. Um, workflow. Uh, two more cities couldn't make it, but they're still preparing for these 0.6 release and they're hoping to have that done next week. So if you have any questions on that, you may want to reach out to him. And I did sign up for the KubeCon. Uh, for the office hours, which will give us two 45 minute sessions. Does anybody have any preference on times when they actually do send out the request to sign up? Um, if you want me to help, <laughs> like end of the day <laughs> in Europe. End of the day Europe time? Uh, okay. Yeah, 1 a.m. it's not really my time. <laughs> To be online. Well, these are all Europe time anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, but like 7 a.m., uh, like uh, 6 a.m., I can do it. Uh, 1 a.m., I think <laughs> would be harder. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I don't think we should take the decision based on me. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I'll keep that in mind, though, because you're right. We, do, we should try to get people from the, from the states in there. It would be better if it's later in the day. Okay. In that case, before we jump into issues and PRs, anything from the agenda I forgot to add? All right, in that case, I know last week we talked about possibly merging Slinky's uh, SQL expression language PR, uh, but he pinned me offline saying uh, he's been working on it. He thinks it's pretty much ready to go. Um, and even though I mentioned that we were probably gonna merge it this week, he said, let's hold off another week because uh, it's kind of large and he's in no rush for it to get in. So unless someone really, really wants it in there right now, I'm, I'm inclined to give into his request and say, okay, we'll wait one more week before we merge that. Is that okay with everybody? All right, yes. cool. Yep, okay. Yeah, I didn't think anybody was in a big rush other than it'd be nice to have a rough draft, an official rough draft. Okay, in that case, next one. So this was mine in response to Lance's request for a little bit more uh, formalness around our decision to change how we're gonna merge trivial typo type PRs. Um, so basically I'll let you guys read the text here, but here, is the text I added to the governance doc. Give you a chance to read that. Okay, so the point here is to make it so that we can merge typo type changes without having to worry about new branches, new releases and stuff like that. There, there's obvious things that Obviously, it's just typos, but anything pretty much bigger than a typo will probably, well, then have to go through the normal release process. And we just want to make our life a little bit easier. So hopefully, Lance, that satisfies your, your concern and your ask. 
Yeah, that looks great. Thanks. Okay, cool. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, any objection to approving that? Cool. Uh, right. Wordsmithing, natural oh. might be nature. Where? Um, we'll line them line, up. Third word. Nature, got it. Uh, hold on, I'll forget if I don't fix it. Uh, nature, trivial nature, yes. Okay, got it, cool. Thank you, Eric. Okay, and approved, whoops, good golly. <laughs> I have major issues here, okay, cool. Now that was it in terms of PRs that are ready to go. I did notice a couple of commits go flying by this morning. So obviously that's too soon to talk about those or to, to approve those. But did anybody who do any of those commits want to talk about their PR? I think I may have seen something from Lance and Clements. Either one of you guys want to talk about yours? Um, yeah, I did work on the schema registry replication to the point that I think it, the, the validation now passes. Okay. Uh, except for the DCO issue. Um, is there anything you wanted to specifically bring up and draw people's attention to, or is it just a matter of people finding time to review it? Uh, yeah, I think at this point, then people should go and 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 review it because I made some clarification. There were some, there maybe was some weird. Um, I, I made I, so generally, I made some some um, some fixes to links because I had to go and do links throughout the document. Um, so I made some some headline changes, um, as you see. There are more changes throughout the document, but really the meat is at, at the bottom. Um, and those are the, um, the, uh, the subscriptions API. Oh, so that should not be there. I think that's the problem I was there. Oh, that, okay. Should, yeah, so there should only be, I think that's what I pulled in. That's what the DCO issue is, All right? So oh, we're only looking at this. So the, the, ignore the rest, uh, I'll go and fix that. Okay. Um, so I have two events that are defined. So I'm defining cloud events and cloud events. Um, and uh, those are for um, updated and deleted. Updated also covers created. And so whenever, there's, there are three modes. If you scroll up a little bit, um, I can go to the, to the, the actual definitions of all so things. How far, how far up did you want me to go? Um, where it ends up being green, where it's, where it's no longer green. Um, I think four, section four is what I added completely. Okay. So there, there. yes. Okay. And um, so I'm explaining effectively three types of replication models. Um, let, me, let me talk about the motivation for this for, for a moment. Um, I believe that most of these um, infrastructures um, uh, will compose, so most of the event brokers will compose in some way, and we will have um, scenarios where we will have to go and route from one to the other. And we're having one concrete example between Klaus, what Klaus does and what we do, um, where there is um, uh, in Klaus system over in SAP, they have a event broker inside of their own application where they do a lot of event driven stuff. And now they want to involve involve applications that are hosted inside of Azure, so we kind of need to go and and uh, uh, connect all the, connect those things up in a way. And so applications will first post to the SAP event broker. They will probably have to go to one or two hops inside of the SAP world, and then the events will hop over to the Microsoft broker and will be distributed from there. So that's these multi-hop scenarios is something that I envision will be more and more common. So now the question is, if you're using a model like what you would use, what you today use with Kafka, where um, you are effectively writing an app and you have some code um, that um, defines the events, and then you start publishing the events, in, a, in Kafka, your, your code effectively starts writing to the schema registry um, as soon as uh, it publishes one of these new events. And, and, and so the question there is, how does, and, and those events are no, the, the, the payload for those events is not, cannot be understood or deciphered by the receiver un, until they have that event, the schema, the event schema. 
So the question here is how do we make it possible for um, the, the schema registry that sits kind of alongside this event broker to also replicate along those flow paths? So that's the thought behind this. And um, there's, so I'm explaining some topo potential topologies in this section. And then I'm, I'm landing on, there's a pull model and there's a push model and then there's an event driven model. The push model is that a, you have a, a schema registry and it knows about a target schema registry. It gets, it is configured. And whenever a change is being made in the source registry, it goes and just pushes to the target registry um, using the target registry's schema API, right? So it the, the, the source registry gets an, uh, is updated and it turns around and just updates the other one through its normal registry API. So that's one possible path. The other path is that you have, and this might all be dependent on, you know, what the firewalls rules are, what the vis visibility is of these systems. One might be behind a firewall and that might determine whether you're going to do a push or pull. Uh, the, the pull replication is effectively when the target registry, which runs the data, calls the, the, the source registry to go and enumerate the, um, the contents periodically, and then goes in and adds its data to, um, to itself. So I, I'm just also mentioning that. And then the last one is the, um, um, the, the event-driven model for which I have the events at the bottom, where Every time an event, every time a schema or a schema group or a schema or a schema version changes, or when it's deleted, we're raising an event, and then the party which is receiving the event notification through cloud events can then go and turn around and fetch the change. So that would kind of be the 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 middle ground between the between the two and kind of the event-driven reactive way of doing those changes. So I'm defining all of those. All, all of those three cases. And then there is a, um, yeah, and then I'm effectively, I'm also referring there to our, to the authority model, which we already have in the, in the, in the schema registry. Um, that is it. And then again, the, 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 the fact that the subscription API sits in there, that's a, that's an error that I need to go and fix. So uh, also Doug, so because, because of that error, I'm actually going to go and do a new PR for this. So you don't have to worry about this. Okay. Lots of interesting stuff in here. Okay, so, any high level questions for Clemens? Okay. So I think it sounds like people just need to take the time to go off and read the changes. Thank you Clemens for doing all that. Um, once we get past any uh, wording changes or, or issues that people might find from here on out. Um, is, is there more work on your side that you're planning on doing on this, or do you think it's pretty much ready to go and get reviewed and merged? So I, I think it's a, I mean, there's, I think the core, the core thing I wanted to land in there is are these literally the two event definitions, mm -hmm. but I think, so the rest of it is, is to motivate those two event definitions. Okay. But, but, but you're basically, from your perspective, it's basically ready to go, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, all right, last chance. Any questions for Clemens before we move on? All right, cool, thank you, Clemens. Uh, Lance, was I wrong? Did you, I, did you, did I see a commit go by behind you? Anything you wanna talk about on this one or just have people review it when they get a chance? I, I just, um, <laughs> after coming back to it, you know, not having looked at it for a long time, it's, uh, I just, it was way overly complicated. I just simplified it. I took some of the your suggestion, and um, I don't remember who made the other comment, but yeah, I just greatly simplified it. Okay. Okay. Some people, when you get a chance, um, take a look at this one. It's just for the primer, so it's not normative, but still, be good to get a review on that one. Any any comments or questions for the group before we move on? Okay, in that case, ignoring the PR stuff. Oh, wait a minute. Jim, on yours, since you're on the call, you're, are you waiting for an up, a thing from Clemens on this one or are we waiting an update from you? I can't remember the status of this one. I, whilst I'd love to throw it at Clemens, I feel <laughs> you're actually waiting for me. Uh, okay. And I've, I've been sidetracked on the SDK, I'm afraid, so. Okay, that's fine. Just wanted to give you a chance to speak to it if you wanted to. 
No, okay. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. In that case, let's move forward with some of the open issues. In particular, this one I thought might be interesting and problematic. So therefore, it must be Clemens. So therefore, Clemens, you want to talk to this one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is something that uh, Phil Hack brought up on Twitter to me. Um, and this is something that we had already kind of flagged internally a while ago. Um, but for some reason, I um, so I, at Microsoft, it was something that we stumbled upon, and um, uh, I then failed to 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 uh, file the issue. And then someone externally came and said, "Hey, there's this thing." And I said, "Whoa, wait, sorry, there was something." So now I filed the issue. Um, so the 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 webhook spec is um, uh, I I made a mistake. I wrote, I wrote most of it, so therefore I'm, it's my mistake. And that's the following. The origin header that we are using in, the, in this webhook spec has a very, very deceivingly similar function to the origin header of cores, so the cross-origin resource sharing. And um, I, have, I, had, I had used effectively the, 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 the I only had looked at the core spec, um, and I had not looked at 6454, which score which course is referencing, um, and um, I had not looked closely enough. Um, the origin header in cores, um, which is effectively defining which to which um, which site context this request comes from, comes from um, that, is a, that is a URI. The origin that we're using here is the, the push engine from which that request comes from, which is also origin. So I, as I wrote this spec, I kind of conflated those two concepts in my head. Um, that would not be terrible um, if the core, if our origin header which I defined um, uh, is a simple DNS expression. And the origin header as defined in RFC 50, 6454 is a URI. Um, and it is a URI that must be uh, the root of the site. So I can't remember what happened in my head, whether that was, whether I just ignored the fact that this is a URI because there was only the root address um, and then misinterpreted it. So, so we now have a conflict that is entirely my, my fault where we we're, we're using in the spec the origin header or, or a header named origin that is defined as carrying a DNS uh, name, which has a different semantic function than the origin header that is defined in RFC in that RFC. And also, they differ in the rules for how the header value is formed. One is the DNS, DNS expression, and one is a URI. One is a URI. Now we have two choices that I'm, and that's something that I'm, I'm pointing out in the, in the, in this issue. That is, we can basically ignore the fact that 6454 exists, and so I can say, you know, this is not using cores. It's actually not relevant. We can also ignore the existence of uh, uh, of that spec, um, and um, and then just say, yep, yeah, okay, we have a name clash, and our origin header is this, and the semantics are that, and be okay. Um, the problem is that course so the cross origin resource sharing mechanism is by now so commonplace that it's kind of baked into the HTTP stack. So um, they header kind of all by themselves without you being able to go and sometimes probably without you being able to override it. So so we can we could we could wish it go away, but then it might not go away. The alternative B would be to say, yep, yeah, okay, we're gonna go and change, we're gonna change the implementations and we will use our header, which we already use for the, the handshake, and we're gonna go and rename that thing into webhook request origin. Um, and uh, and let that be, be be the DNS expression. Um, so my my preference would be B, but 
that would be a fix that would effectively break from the the prior definition. Now, that said, it's impossible <laughs> at this point to implement the to implement that spec the spec as we have it really correctly, and that's why my dev team um, actually didn't. So what they did is they literally did what I did what I did in B, what I'm proposing in B. That's what they did. They looked at the spec and said, well, "Sorry, we can't use origin because origin is is uh, um, is an H a URI. We have to use something else. So we're just going to go and reuse that header. That's what they, that's what they did in our implementation. So now I humbly I humbly submit this problem to all of you to judge over me because it's my mistake. <laughs> and we will judge you harshly. Um, <laughs> All right. So and first, and I, did I say that I'm really sorry? I am really yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, but so you first, all voted for it. Yeah, yeah. So, so first off, does anybody have any questions about the the situation itself? Just for clarity's sake, first. Does everybody understand what's going on? Okay. Um, I, I I have a quick question for you. Um, yeah. <sighs> So the, the, this origin header is related to cores. Do people use cores and cloud events together often? I, I don't think so, but we also can't. Um, so it, it, you might be, you might, you might go and, and have the situation where you have an app on the web page that's raising an event, and there you would have that. Hmm. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Um, okay, so let's then talk about the options available. So Clemens listed two here. Does anybody have any alternative suggestions for options? Or are these two basically the one, only two that people can think of? Okay, not hearing any. <laughs> this, is, this feels so sleazy to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Option B, if we looked at our spec and said, clearly whoever wrote this was smoking something and they got it wrong. Um, and it's just a flat out bug in our spec. Granted, it is a breaking normative change, but still it is busted. You cannot implement this as it currently is written in the spec. Therefore, we are going to make a change without bumping the major version number. I'm pretty sure that has been done in the past and other specs, but I was wondering what people thought about that notion. Do any implementations rely on that? That's that's the other that's the other question, yeah. right? Yes. Because because um, it is one where um, you are allowing a another party, and then as you have allowed that other party to do this, you need to go and, and do some constraint. You would have to implement some constraint based on this. It's basically just just um, valid, it's just allowing you to kind of validate that this is coming from a, the place that you have allowed. Yeah, but what's funny is you don't actually mention that RFC in here. No, I, I do. If you go in um, search for origin. Well, see? All right, see right there. That is there. That. Oh, there we go. So, so I'm, I'm, see, I'm mentioning the origin request header several times, but I'm not even, I'm not even referring to 6454. So, I'm, I can't even tell you, right? So I can't even tell you that whether I, I didn't really mean the web request header. Well, that, well, that, well, that's what I was going to, that, that's actually the path I was heading down. It's like, if you had actually mentioned the other spec, I think it actually would have been easier to justify and convince people that we just goofed, right? Yeah. Because I, we, we knew about the other spec and we didn't mean to do a conflict. We just made a mistake. But yeah. someone could look at this and say, where's the mistake? You define a new header. Okay, it overlaps with somebody else or with some other yeah. spec, but who cares? Yeah, so, so, so I, have, I have had a, I have had a, had a, had a, some not in my head at that point, um, where which made me write the the origin header kind of the, in in these three places where I'm referring to just origin. So there, and then and then next and then the next 
the next one. So I have three mentions of origin, but I'm not even referring to the other spec. So that's that is what I find my even even me looking at the thing that I wrote makes me puzzled for how I landed at that point. Hmm. So. Yeah. Okay, so need people to speak up here in terms of what their opinion is on this. Even in support. <laughs> Do we have anyone that's actually implemented the webhook? Because I've, I've done a little bit in the SDK, but I, I haven't really seen any like in the real world examples of the webhook spec in use. Yeah. So event grid does, and event grid does <laughs> ends up ends up happens to to actually do what is in B. Event grid, I mean. Yeah. Well, I think I think regardless of which direction we choose to go, we probably do need to reach out to the community through an email or whatever to, to get some feedback, or at least to give people the chance to give feedback before we make a decision here. Um, I think that's a given. Um, I don't know what do people think about option B. Yeah, I think we just have to put our hands up, don't we, and and, and just roll with it. Well, Clemens does obviously because he was the author. <laughs> Never gonna let it go. Never gonna let it go. I mean, this is a. I, I understand this is a case of beer kind of bug and. Wait, wait. Did you did you just say beer kind of bug? No, it's a case of beer. I owe a case of beer kind of bug. Oh, oh, oh! I thought I thought you were implying you were drinking as you were writing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a, a, I owe a case of beer to the group kind of bug. <laughs> okay, got it. That's fine. Uh, okay. Even though you all voted for it. That's true. You, yeah, you could, you could blame this. The, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? The, um, not the secure, not the, not the validators. The quality control people in the group. Yes, you can blame us. Yes. So Klaus, since you spoke up on this, what's your take on it? Yeah, um, actually, I, I think we also have an implementation of this, and I, I would have to check with my colleagues uh, what exactly they did. But yeah, I think it's it's cleaner, as I said. I mean, um, to to switch to the webhook request origin. Okay. Um, so I think people need probably a little more time to think about it. Clemens, would you be one to take an AI to write an email to the mailing list asking for for the community at large to look at this and, and ponder it and give feedback either through email or through the issue? Yes, sir. Cool, thank you very much. Okay, barring that, I'm um, hearing most people who choose to speak up are leaning towards option B. Um, anybody else wanna chime in or just people just need time to think about it? Okay, I'm gonna assume people just want time to think about it. Okay, well, cool. Thank you, Clemens, for, uh, for writing this up and bringing it forward. Gotta get things fixed. So, moving on. <clears throat> so, last week we talked about these two issues. And let me bring them both up here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, so first one was Jim. You were basically asking whether we need to have some sort of life cycle relative to state in the discovery spec for the services. And the second one was, I think that it's kind of related to what should a client do when a service disappears in the, as a result of a get, or in, in response to a get, a service appears to have disappeared, <laughs> appears to have disappeared. Uh, it, it seems to have vanished as that. Um, and how should the receiver of that interpret it? Should they say, it's gone now, do they need to wait a period of time to realize it's really gone or whatever? Okay, and unfortunately, I don't think oh, I can remember the person's name. I think I think it was Jennifer. I, th I think that was her name. Um, said she wasn't necessarily against the idea of a service lifecycle type stuff to it, um, at least from a deprecation perspective. So I thought a little bit about the conversation we had last week, and what I was going to do. And I apologize, I didn't get a chance to write this up formally. Was I was wondering whether we can look at po two possible stepped solutions here. One is to make it clear that. Something missing in the get, the, the receiver has no choice. They have to assume it's been deleted. Um, I, I think 
the only weird edge case is if there was ever only one service in the uh, in the discovery thing, and suddenly that, and then your get was completely empty. You may not know what, for sure whether there was a bug someplace or or really is deleted. But I think in most cases there will probably be more than one. So having one missing out of an entire list of things, but you still got a completely valid HTTP response, just feels like a weird thing um, from a, for a bug to manifest itself that way. Unless someone actually deleted it by mistake by fat fingering something, but in that case, well, tough. That's the state of the system, and we want we don't want to lie to people. So I think you have no choice to say missing equals deleted from a, from a client perspective. But then a phase two kind of a thing is say, okay, that's fine, but should we look at adding some sort of additional optional property that allows a discovery endpoint to say this thing is will be deleted at this particular time? I don't particularly like the phrase plan deletion time, but you get my point, right? Where the presence of that time stamp says the service has been deprecated, it will go away at this particular time, so we're just giving you a warning, but it is optional for them to use, but we would recommend it as a heads up to people if they want to take some action. Anyway, I think that we at least probably need to do one if we want, if we want to agree that missing equals deleted and then think about possible phase two or a second step. But I wanted to open that up for discussion and see what people thought. And particularly, Jim, when you were talking about lifecycle, did you want complete multi-step lifecycle or is a deprecation kind of a thing simple enough to meet what you were thinking of? Well, I, when certainly you know, when we look at what we do internally, I mean, deprecation and retired means something different. Um, so to us, deprecation means you shouldn't, you know, we're still doing it, but you shouldn't add any more dependencies on it. So whether, you know, whether a deprecated state means um, that you don't accept any new subscriptions. I guess that's an interesting scenario. Um, and I, it's interesting as we see the word retired, I'm not sure I, obviously that makes sense from an internal or a, a documentation perspective. Um, if you expect this portal to be used to, as a sort of data source for documentation as well, I think retired is useful. Um, because you can, you know, it, it's blindingly obvious then that you shouldn't, you can't subscribe to this anymore. And, and, you know, it did go away. It's not that you're, it's not that you're going mad. It didn't vanish to, um, to use your terminology. So I can understand why a consumer side may want to have some sort of retired state for their users to say, yeah, this thing used to be there, but it's not available anymore for you to use. And maybe you're, you're choosing to show it for historical reasons or, or for whatever. But does that mean that in your opinion, the discovery endpoint itself needs to have a retired state or couldn't the fact that it vanished imply it's retired since you can't really do anything with it anyway? Yeah, I mean, potentially, I mean, we're not, we're not supporting temporal queries, are we? We're not saying what was the state of this last Thursday, for instance. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'd buy, I'd buy into that. I, I maybe just active and deprecated then, or whatever. Um, and presumably, with deprecated, we should, um, we should give some indication as to when it's going to retire. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's what I was kind of thinking is that we have this sort of timestamp here that gives you. I think at least those two states is no timestamp means active timestamp being there says it's been deprecated and when it's going to actually vanish. And then when it actually does, when that time passes, then you can actually remove the whole service and lack of being there means it's retired or gone. I, I, I guess I prefer something explicit rather than inferring. I, 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 I think because you could have multiple active versions potentially or one active and one deprecated um it just seems a bit odd for me to have to pay attention to a different field to see you know and then infer a status from that can you elaborate but, a little on what you meant by you can have multiple versions because i don't think we have the notion of versions well i mean you you have uh well maybe maybe i've gone completely off track then I, your events are versioned yeah um and as you make breaking changes to those events and you move from version one to version two um 
you might be running both in parallel for a while while people get off your old one and get onto the new one um that's what i was alluding to maybe i've misunderstood the discovery side of this thing so if i say show me uh, i don't know um think of an example show me you know give me my um, the, the event endpoint for stock tickers yeah and, it, and that event follows a schema and then we change it in a breaking way um, i'd be then sending both versions for a while and then retiring the old one so i guys i apologize it's been a while since i've looked this back but my assumption no, I mean, it, was... it, it is for me as well i mean i thought that was where this came from originally that i because i remember this came up in a discussion and you said oh could you slap that in an issue um, yeah it's, it's just i don't think we have the notion of uh, so okay for, so first of all i think we're, we're talking about deprecating the entire service not one particular event and I don't think we have the notion of versions between services, right? If you want to have a completely new version of a service, I think from a discovery endpoint perspective, I think you have to create a whole new service and the fact that it may have some correlation or similarity to an existing service is interesting, but I don't think that fact is, is manifested itself in the discovery spec itself, right? There's no link between the two. Uh, so where do you, okay. So maybe I've been confused. So this is, this is really saying your subscription endpoint is moving from location one to location two. What is mm -hmm. it on discovering? Mm -hmm. So no, I, no, I, I think I think what's happening is if you want to have a version two of your of your subscription stuff, then you can create another service in your discovery endpoint, and it happens to look very similar to the previous one, but it's a completely different name, completely different ID. And from discovery endpoints point, it is a completely different service. Okay. Maybe I was confused. Well, I'll go back and double check, but I'm pretty sure we don't have any kind of correlation attributes in our, in our spec today. Okay. Um, and, and, but then to, I want to go back to something else you said about having a, an explicit field that kind of represents state. I think that's, that's interesting and definitely an option. My only concern with that is then we basically have two fields in a service definition that kind of say the same thing, right? You have state and then you could potentially have as this plan deleted deletion timestamp thing, right? And what, you know, how do you then interpret it if the state is, as you called it, what, active, but then that timestamp appears, right? We could, we could put a rule in the spec that says, well, obviously that doesn't make any sense and therefore they're not conformant and they're just wrong, right? But my mind immediately jumps to, well, if those two fields go hand in hand all the time, why not make it easier on people and just make it a single field? Okay. So it's interesting, my, and again, I, I apologize, I can't remember the, all the context of the original conversation. This, no, uh, this notion of when I've subscribed once, yeah, um, am I going to come back? What, what would cause me to come back and check it again to see if it's being retired or deprecated? Um, and so if you think about it from a, a resource change perspective, you know, are we going to emit, a, would you expect an implementation to emit a cloud event saying, you know, this endpoint is going away? That's a good point. I think, I, I know at some point, somebody talked about doing events from discovery endpoints. I think maybe it might've been Scott. I, th I would imagine that, yeah, if any metadata on a service does change, I would think an event should be emitted if someone subscribes to the discovery endpoint itself right. to get events. Yes, I would think. So in which case you would expect, you know, would you expect the event to say it's active, but now it's got a, um, you know, this other date field associated with it? Or would you expect to say that this endpoint is now deprecated? So it's a literal state change. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't know. Okay. My, yeah, I have to think about that. My, my initial reaction is why treat this one as special? Just say, hey, this thing's changed and you can go do a diff yourself. But I could also understand that 
this thing going away is a pretty darn important event and maybe that should have its own special event. Yeah. You could also do the technique of the event doesn't have any context. It just says something changed and it's your responsibility to go query what the change was. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's more akin to the first option I mentioned. Yeah, I agree. But that implies, yeah, okay, I get it. I, that does imply you've got some sort of history because I mean, presumably there's a number of different things that can change, not just the state of it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's a rabbit hole, I'm, I'm yeah. afraid. Okay, well, we definitely don't need to resolve this today. Um, so let, me, so let, me, let me ask this one step at a time kind of thing. Does anybody disagree that missing should be interpreted as the service has been deleted? Okay, what I'll probably do then is I'll write up a PR for that one piece. And then I think, I, I, I personally would like to do a little more thinking about this given everything that Jem said, because I'd, like I'd like to think more about all the, all the things you, you mentioned, Jem. I think there are some interesting aspects to it that I hadn't considered. So I'd like to think more about that before I think we're writing a PR for that. But does anybody disagree with the idea of splitting it into two different discussions or do, they, or do these things two, or do these two things you think have to be linked together and we should resolve them all at once? Okay, I'm not I'm gonna interpret silence as no objection to me splitting the two and I'll do a PR for one and then think deep about part two. Does that sound fair to everybody? Okay, I'm gonna take silence as consent, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else PR issue related people wanna talk about? Okay, any other topics at all people wanna bring up since we're at the end of the agenda? Oh, hey, hey Grant. I, I, I had, uh, uh, with respect to the issues, hey Doug. Mm -hmm. um, I'll paste it in. Here. So, uh, um, wait, where'd you paste it? Uh, I pasted it in the doc. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, was, so I was wondering, and maybe this is a good forum. Um, so, as the spec evolves uh, past 1.0, um, I was wondering if there's a good place for like a, a change log or or some sp significant updates that folks will need to know about um, as the spec evolves. Hey Grant, and... I think I've got an issue somewhere. I'll, I'll find it and paste the link in the chat uh, of exactly that. Um, I was trying to chase a while ago the differences between 0.3 and 1.0. Um, so it may well be that we want to elide those two issues but yes, plus one for the idea of some kind of change log um, that's ideally semantic between versions rather than having to read all the different, I don't want to have to read 30 different commits to tell the difference between 1.00 and 1.01. <laughs> so so yeah. first, yeah, th thanks Grant for bringing this back up. You're right, I, it slipped off my radar. So basically I want, I want to make sure I understand what you guys are asking for. You're basically saying interesting list, but oh my gosh, what a pain in the butt to deal with you want something that someone basically calls through the list and says, these are really the things you guys got to, you, you as a reader need to pay attention to, right? Because these are the big ones. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. So like, I mean, <clears throat> I imagine there'll be like a new field or, or something in the future um, that will be a non-breaking change. It'd be nice to be able to see like, see those uh, small features and, and you not have to come through the, the, huge uh, list of PRs and descriptions. Okay, I'm gonna jump all over this statement. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I did get to it six days later. The, the next comment is, this is the kind of thing, now ideally, um, it, this was me uh, making notes as I went along. Um, ideally, in a proper change log, these would be links to the relevant commits, etc. This is the sort of list that I would find much more useful than just the list of commits, for right. example. Okay, Grant, would something like this, I assume with, yeah, with, with links from here to the actual PRs themselves or issues, would this satisfy your concern, Grant? 
Um, yeah, I well, I think it'd be nice to see. Um, if they were like categorized changes, yeah, by I, this, like added fields and like <clears throat> changed descriptions or or something. Um, I'm just thinking like over the course of a year, like folks will want to know like okay, what's changed? I built my cloud run cloud service to to handle 1.0 events. Are there like new fields I need to take care of for 1.3 events? Right. Okay. So it sounds like this is the list. This is good with links, with groupings or categories. Yeah. Um, okay. That um, yeah. Okay. John, would you be willing to turn this into a PR? Uh, to be honest, no, given that I have two existing action <laughs> items that I haven't managed to get to in the last week beyond, um, I was going to say on the HTTP header uh, action item I have from last week, I have made some progress on an internal doc enumerating some options. It's just not ready for public consumption yet. Um, but while I'm already uh, drowning under things I have promised to commit to, um, I don't want to commit to anything else. But but if somebody else wants to take that list and please validate it, because this was you know, um, half a year ago when I knew less about cloud events than I do now, and I'm still a novice. Um, if anyone else wants to take that list and create a PR, um, I'm certainly not going to feel, hey, that was my work. <laughs> yeah. Right. OK. Uh, sorry, my brain went fro frozen there for a second. Grant, would you be willing to, to, to do this? Um, I, perhaps I can yeah, help and bring something up next time. I'm going to comment on the GitHub issue at least. Okay, that'd be great. Because yeah, because I, I I think everybody's swamped, and well, I think I don't think there's any disagreement that this obviously would be useful to do. It's just a matter of someone to find the time to do it. What I think what might be useful though is um, going forward, we may want to consider changing our process such that as we approve PRs, to ask ourselves, is this change worthy of adding something to? release notes kind of a thing, because that's typically what people do for open source, right? It's, yeah, you know, for this PR, should we add to, should we change the release notes? And I think that's kind of what you're looking for here, Grant. Add yeah. the big ticket items, right? Uh, and so I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, one comment around that, like, I think it would be useful if, so just like looking at the commits for the spec, like maybe it would be useful to have um, like the semantic conventional commits where like you, say if something's a feature or docs. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like, yeah, like Lance has some conventional commits and, but like we don't sort of enforce it. So maybe when we're merging PRs in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I, yeah, basically I, I think we're in agreement. I think there are some process changes we can look at doing going forward to make it easier. So it's not, oh my gosh, we're doing a release and now someone has to do the legwork of just going back and scanning every single PR that we merged. We'll do it as we go along so it's less painful. Um, yeah, I think that's a process change that I, I can look at doing, you know, coming up with a proposal for how to handle that. Um, you just need someone to go through the current list of 1.0 things. Um, so yeah, are, are are we in agreement like that? Uh, adding a new change log file with this, like a, a new file. With the, yeah, with I think that's fine. Thing. Yeah. Okay. So if like I create a PR. Yeah. For that. I got, yeah. That that's what I was looking for. That'd be great. Yes, because it doesn't have to be in the. Obviously, putting something like that into, uh, the release notes itself is interesting, but I don't think most people look at the release notes. I I agree with you. I think people will look for a change log file. Okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, create a PR and we can work there. That'd be cool. Thank you very much, Grant. And John for, for going through this effort too. I appreciate that. And I apologize this this one just completely dropped off my radar. That's fine. I would say uh, this list of differences was done by taking the 0.3 spec and the 1.0 spec and just diffing them. So the, it may well not map cleanly to PRs or commits. Um, because the same section may have changed multiple times, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that's more to Grant if he were expecting to find corresponding commits than anyone else. And it may well be that 
maybe this this bit of change log from point three to uh, one zero zero doesn't end up having links because it would just take too long to to work them all out. And I think that that's okay as well. Um, it would be good if we could have links moving forward. Yep, I would agree. Cool. All right, I, good discussion. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that we do have some automation around stuff like this in the um, JavaScript SDK um, that you know we might want to look at for some sort of uh, I don't know ideas about how to uh, format commits and uh, automate some of the things like the actual release processes and versioning and stuff like that and generating the change logs automatically. Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Thank you, Lance. All right, anything else on this topic you want to bring up? All right, any other topics at all people want to bring up in the whole seven minutes left? All right, in that case, here's the list of people I have. Did I miss anybody? I think I got everybody. All right, in that case, let me just double check. I'm pretty sure, yeah, we still have nothing on the agenda for the SDK call. So I think there will be no SDK call today. And last chance, anything people wanna bring up before we adjourn? All right, in that case, thank you everybody. Another good call and we'll talk again Bye. next week. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.